Hi, my name is Ray Arzaleta. Today I'm going to talk to you about biomimicry. Mimic life. Emulate intelligent design. Simply said is, let's ask nature how she does business. If our farms and ranches would emulate nature more, not only will we heal the soils, we would heal and improve human health. Not only that, we would improve the climate and we would also heal our rural communities. Let's go down this journey of biomimicry. The common pattern was that not only did I not understand the three basic concepts, these basic concepts I'm gonna to talk to you, it was not only myself, but farmers and ranchers, and also those who attended many of the universities. These are the three things I want us to walk away with that are very, very critical. And I'm going to show you several case studies to depict how some of these producers uh, now understand those three basic concepts. The first one is the soil is alive. Very critical and important. You'd be surprised how many farmers just look at the soil as a growing medium. It's not alive. I myself had that same concept. Number two, I did not understand the power of relationship, connectness, all is one. Ecology teaches all is one. Quantum physics teaches all is one. Theology teaches all is one. Why should we care about that? If you do not understand how things are connected, you can do a lot of damage with your tools because you don't understand how all the creatures, all the plants are connected to each other. What, how you impact one creature or one organism or one habitat impacts the other very critical to understand that number three understand the goal this is so important i wish i would have understood this goal when i left college or when i was in the peace corps my goal is to emulate nature there's nothing more frustrating is to work and work and not know what the goal is let's continue down this path as i've taught all over north america Canada to Mexico, been exposed to hundreds, thousands of people. I have came to the conclusion that the most difficult thing to heal is not the farm and ranch soils, but what's between our ears. It's the way we process information. It's the way we look at the world. It's our filters. Another process that makes it very difficult for change on the farm and ranch is called social conditioning. It's the social conditioning on the local farming community. If a farmer or rancher wants to do regenerative farming or ranching, the pressure is brutal because the farmers and ranchers in the local community are saying, why are you doing it this way? Social conditioning exists and it's very difficult to overcome and it takes an incredibly brave person to overcome it. What shatters our way of thinking are filters. It's an aha moment. All of us have to go through that. I had an epiphany. I had an attitude shift. Mine happened in 2001 when I saw that farmers were still going broke, could not bring their children into the operation. And I said, how many acres does it really take to make a living? That bothered me. And we spent billions and billions of dollars to clean the water and the water was still not getting clean. That was troublesome to me. Being exposed to many, many people, I realized quickly that what separated the top 10% from the rest of the herd was this mindset, the way they thought, the way they process information. These people were intentional, very giving, willing to learn, willing to adapt. They were willing to pick up the skills so they can learn how to use the tools correctly. Mindset is everything. It's the way we look at the world and how we're willing to approach the problem. With this case study of Jason Miller, you will see what kind of mindset it takes to change your farm and operation. Jason's from Marshing, Idaho. The elevation is 2,300 feet above sea level. Typical rain is about 11 inches and he gets about eight inches of snow. As you can see, it's mountainous, but also 
lots of irrigation. Let's listen to Jason about his journey and how he became a farmer scientist and how he emulates and mimics nature. Two years ago, Jason Miller embarked on a journey towards soil health to solve issues he faced on his farm. With a sloping field and surface irrigation, Miller was losing topsoil to erosion. He was also looking for ways to keep his cattle feed costs down during the winter. Miller wondered if the soil health principles of cover crops, mob grazing, and no-till farming could address those issues and be profitable. He decided to do a field-by-field -field comparison. First he would plant and harvest his entire field in barley. Then he would plant cover crops and mob graze them. Finally, he would till half the field and plant it in corn. On the other half, he would plant corn with a no-till drill. Miller hoped to measure the health of the soil while tracking the economic and environmental impacts of making the change from tillage to no-till. My name is Jason Miller. Um, my family has farmed and ranched in the Marsing area for the last 60 years. So some of the challenges I'm facing with this field here are uh, soil erosion. The first couple of irrigations every year are pretty challenging to keep the ground stable and to keep sediment from running off the end of the field. Uh, it's been conventionally tilled for the last 25 years. It's furrow irrigated and it has a slope of about 7%. It is estimated that 15 million tons of soil are lost to wind and water erosion every year in Idaho. Like many farmers, Miller is trying to figure out how to keep his most precious resource, topsoil, on his field. So right now we're in the middle of my cover crop mix that I planted in uh, barley stubble. And uh, what that means is, is um, this, as you can imagine, was a field of barley that we harvested with the combine. And coming in directly behind the combine, we planted this uh, mix with a no-till drill. This right here is a, a hunter hybrid turnip. Miller it planted a multi-species cover crop forage mix that would germinate in the heat but stay green until a deep freeze. This ensured soil coverage and diversity in cattle feed while capturing nitrogen, breaking up hard pan, and reducing water and wind erosion. Today is December 29th. Um, we're standing in the cover crop pasture again. Um, as you can see, see, there's still a lot of green left in the field, um, which is pretty uncommon for this time of year to have green feed for the cattle to graze. These cows have a really high uh, nutritional requirement, so to have something um, like this to graze is just, is just huge. And, and not only that, but it's, it's very economical for us too. Um, we're not having to, to feed hay, which obviously costs money, or provi provide uh, protein supplements, um, which also get, get fairly expensive. And so by, by using cover crops, we figure we saved last year roughly around $20,000 um, in what we would have had to feed in hay. And so that's, that's huge for our operation, um, being a smaller family farm. Um, the less we feed hay, the better. And for us, having, having this green, lush feed to come onto in the winter is, is huge for us, and I know the cows love it too. Comparative soil tests of Miller's conventionally tilled and no-tilled fields revealed surprising findings. The overall results showed that Miller's cover crop and mob grazing regime had begun to build a healthier soil ecosystem. One of my main goals with this field is to do everything consistently and evenly. I want to be able to say that there, the no-till practice versus the conventional practice, there should be no difference in, in the corn's ability to, to yield. The process begins um, as far as planning is concerned. Um, we, we came in and on the conventional side, we uh, dissed it twice, uh, we moldboard plowed it, and then we culture packard or groundhogged it. Uh, basically just the way um, most farmers do it in this area, uh, just basically preparing that to be planted. 
Um, from there we came in and uh, we, we put our fertilizer down and then we had a better come through. And then how we did it on the no-till side of things, um, we just went through and sp um, sprayed out the what little bit of cover crop was trying to come back this spring. And then we applied our fertilizer and then we went back and refurrowed those um, existing corrugates um, to prepare it to be planted. No-till farming can be a paradigm shift for many farmers. A clean, freshly tilled seedbed with no residue has long been considered the ideal blank slate for planting. But no-till farming proves that residue is healthy while bare soil is missing biological diversity. One concern I have and a fear that I have is I'm, I'm a little bit of afraid that that corn in the no-tilled side of things might not come as, as uniformly. Several different reasons. Um, one is, is uh, it's a little firmer over there. I don't know if in places where it might be a little more compact, if that's going to inhibit root growth and, and that plant's ability to, to grow. Another concern I have is the, the residue that was left in the field. So today we are checking the water. In a no-till system, you want some residue, but you don't want too much in a furrow irrigated field like this because the only way for water to get from point A to point B is, is down the core gate. And so I, I don't know if I slept very good last night, but I was concerned that we might have too much residue and those rows might be breaching and, and traveling into the second row there. And uh, Coming here this morning, it was a good sight to know that almost all the rows had gone through on their own. One thing that we're, we're trying to measure here is what's the difference in the sediment loss off of these two fields. Um, is there a noticeable difference in the, the no-tilled portion? Um, we think there should be, but, but that's what uh, Robin Hadler with NRCS is going to come out here this morning and, and help us test that. Okay, I'm Robin Hadler. I work with the Canyon Soil Conservation District, and we're out here today doing some water samples on this field. Uh, we will be sampling the water coming into the furrow, and we will also be sampling the water coming out of the furrow. On the no-tilled side of the field, the sediment was significantly less than the tilled side of the field. Um, you could visually see the difference in the waste ditch at the bottom of the field because the, the waste ditch on the tilled side was completely full of sediment compared to the no-tilled side which had very marginal sediment. And that all directly enters the Snake River. So it's, it's pretty obvious that we saved at least 68%. One key observation I made during this project was while we were irrigating. As the water was going down the core gates, I noticed that the water on the no-tilled portion of the field subbed across the bed, meaning the water came up to the seed significantly better on the no-tilled side than it did on the conventional tilled side. So some of the observations I made um, as the corn was growing last year uh, between the two different fields was um, the uniformity. That was the main thing I saw. So by adding cover crops, mob grazing, and no-till farming, I put another $163 per acre in my pocket that I wouldn't have had if I would have left that field fallow and conventionally tilled it. So I had a couple favorite parts of this project. Um, one being, you know, after planting the cover crop and seeing it grow, um, putting the cows out there and seeing how excited they get always makes me smile. One of my other favorite parts of the project was planting the no-till portion of the corn and seeing the corn come up and you know all those days that you didn't get much sleep and to see that it was a success and at the end of the project showing that and proving to myself that I actually made more money on the no-tilled side of the corn makes me happy and makes me more willing to try it again and try new things uh, more often because the only way you're going to find out if it works or not is if you try. Jason Miller's case study is a great example and how Jason will learn how to emulate the prairie and the forest. He learned all the principles and the strategies from the natural system. Jason's case study is a great example how all of the principles of soil health can be learned. It was through his research he found out that it was important to understand his context. That's why he did his research. Will the principles work within his context? Context is everything. You need to understand your environmental, your ecological, your economic, your cultural context, and your spiritual context. Without understanding your context, you won't understand the rest of the principles. Another principle that's very critical is living roots. 
Jason understood how important putting living roots, arm of the soil, diversity of organisms, animal integration, and another principle that Jason learned, and it made a huge impact on his operation, about reducing tillage, learning how to be very careful about your tools. It's the way we use our pesticides, our tillage, overhanging, too much fertilizer, too much manure, all impact the microbes. We need to understand our tools. Jason also learned that right here is the most important thing he can do is put more living roots. We must put living roots 24 seven. What you see there is a picture of living roots with aggregates hanging down on the root. Aggregates is the fusion of sand, silts, and clays created by microorganisms. And those biotic glues create habitat. And you can only create that habitat through plants and living organisms. That is what changes infiltration rates, allows you to hold more water. It creates habitat. Wrapping it up, we're going to show you one more case study. And the reason I show this, two case studies, Jason Miller and Alejandro Carrillos from Chihuahua, Mexico, is to show the power of life to overcome even the most driest, harsh habitats. Alejandro is from the Chihuahuan Desert. He's a, he's a dual citizenship, got his master's in the United States. I went to college here. Alejandro's ranch is located right here. 600 cow calf operation, 6 to 11 inches, fourth generation rancher. Alejandro's in the middle and Jesus right here. These are the two leaders and his son, a catalyst. This is one of the most memorial trip I've ever taken to show the power of life. Let's uh, let Alejandro and the ranchers tell their own story. Chihuahuan Desert, the largest desert of North America. Once lush grasslands supporting bison, antelope, sheep, golden eagle, and prairie dogs. Nowadays unproductive, eroded, lifeless land. There is no water on site. There is no life on site. There is no hope on site. But there is something going on right in the middle of the desert. A few determined to green the desert to a large scale. Yes, they are the heroes of yesterday. The vaqueros or cowboys, once legendary for taming the wild. Nowadays, our best allies to get things back on track. They are working in sync with Mother Nature, moving cattle every day using fences and water points, mimicking the migratory patterns of bison decades ago. As cattle moves, they fertilize and work the soil so life can come back once rain hits the ground. This transformation is already there, even if there are islands of grass across on the vast Chihuahuan desert. We can replicate these successful experiences. We can fix the water cycle. We can cool this arid environment. We can create habitat for wildlife. We can keep people on the land. We are in. We are cool. We are ranchers willing to tackle the certification. As you can see, what's happening in our globe is that over 
of the total land mass is being exposed to bare ground. Our grazing lands, our cropping lands do not have its living skin, the plant. The soil is naked, hungry, thirsty, and running a fever. This is why so much sensible heat and latent heat is given off into the atmosphere and pushing clouds away. Global warming is really an effect of global ignorance, global disconnectness. We do not understand the power of life. One of the most critical things I learned that the greatest geological force is life itself. Who would have thought that that plant growing out of that rock is because of biology? It is these making association with our visca mycorrhizae fungi that can break the rock down. Bacteria break rock down. They make an association with life, biology. Without plants and without living organisms, we would be just like Mars. This is the basic concepts that I want you to walk away. The soil is alive. Our planet is alive. We must understand relationship and connectness. Everything is one. And never forget that the goal is biomimicry, mimic life. In conclusion, if you want to make small changes, whether in your life or your farm or your operation, change how you do things. But if you want to make major changes, change how you see things. If we change the way we see things, and we start to emulate and to have relationship with the natural system, we not can only heal the climate, we can heal our health, we can have healthy plants, healthy animals, healthy water, healthy climate. Thank you.